You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And that's a Chinese proverb. Welcome to Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio. And I just want to let you know that you are listening to the winning book radio show, Off the Shelf. Welcome to this Saturday, April the 10th. You guys, time is blowing by so fast. You know, you have stuff scheduled out or whatever you're doing in your life. And you think, oh, that's in May or June and I've got time. I, you know, you just started with that quote. It before you know it, is here. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. And that's, again, a, Ch- a Chinese proverb. I'm excited to introduce you to the guests who we have uh, on deck for our show today. But before I do, I just want to encourage you. This is so important, and I've learned it in the 50 years, plus years I've been on this earth, is to you, we have to do things every day to to prove to ourselves that we love and value ourselves. We have to. We must. It could be taking a walk in nature, sitting down, enjoy reading a, a, a good book, enjoying a bubble bath, a, a, going for a swim, a bike ride, listening to some music that you love. I love jazz, but whatever it is, we have to do, I would say, at least three things a day that you, you, you prove to yourself you love yourself. There's so many parts to us. If we don't take care of ourselves, and I mean really loving ourselves, owning our lives, taking responsibility for ourselves, something could happen. It's like the next major thing that comes into your life, and it could really, really crush you. So I, I can't, I cannot stress that enough. And I talk about these things and other things and the, the easy daily techniques, easy. You know how busy our lives can get and awaken blessings of inner love. I really encourage you to get a copy of that book. It's really simple things you can do every day. If you don't do these things in life in this world being what it is, something could come and knock you out, and you don't want that. That's nonfiction for fiction. Uh, if you love, if for those of you who have kids, your parents, your school teacher, this book teaches team building and kindness. Team building and kindness. I really encourage you to get a copy of Rosetta, the talent show queen. She is one spunky. I mean, she is. She's one of those kind of. She's not a full Dennis the Menace. Pippi Longstocking Dennis the Menace. Rosetta is like a mix of both of them. What is she up to at the biggest event in the entire school? You can find out if you get a copy of Rosetta, the talent show queen. They're at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Books, Apple Books, iTunes, you name it, in print and ebook. If you don't see it on the shelves, just ask the clerk, would you want a copy of Rosetta, the talent show queen, or Waking Blessings of Inner Love by Denise Turney, because they're carried by the largest book distributors in the world. Go treat yourself to a good book. And now let us go and meet our very special off-the-shelf guest. And I, I am excited when I came across her, and I can't remember if I, if I stumbled across her on the Internet or where I learned about her. It might have been in a local newspaper, but I said, i got to get her on off-the-shelf. And our special off-the-shelf guest this morning is Erica Denise. What a beautiful name. <laughs> Erica is a former teacher. She's a literacy advocate lover of books, and founder of Culture Books. Go, Erica. And this is a bookstore located in Chattanooga, Tennessee. That's why I'm I'm thinking, where did I come across her? Did I see her in a newspaper? And about Culture Books, it said, we are dedicated to bringing books of culture into high-risk communities. We want to build literacy confidence through cultural storytelling events, cultural awareness, and a literacy program. And bridging the gaps between literacy and culture. And we truly appreciate, I I encourage you to go over to her website when I give it out. We truly appreciate what Erica has brought and what she continues to bring to Chattanooga. And it's a a city about two hours north of Atlanta, for those of you who are like, where's Chattanooga? And it's also within two hours of Nashville, Atlanta, about an hour from Knoxville. I forget how far from Charlotte, North Carolina, but it's centrally located. So you can drop in the culture book, especially when it's COVID lives. P- 
please check Miss Erica Denise uh, and Culture Books out online. And I'm gonna give you her website. If you got a pen and a paper, you can write it down. You can type it. You can bookmark it. And it's Culture Books Chat C H A dot org. And I'm gonna spell it C U L T U R E B O O K S C H A dot org. And again, C U L T U R E B O O K S C H A dot org. We are absolutely honored to have Ms. Erica here with us on Off the Shelf Bookstalk Radio this morning. I so appreciate what she's doing in the community. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Erica. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. How are you? I am blessed. I'm absolutely blessed on this. Here in Chattanooga, rain kind of looked like it's going to rain cloudy, but I'm not complaining. It was just a beautiful day, and we've had beautiful days uh, yesterday, but it looked like it's going to rain today. But um, just thank you for all you're doing. I want to tell you the first few questions I ask every guest, because I used to just go right into the questions, and the listeners told me they want a little backstory on the guest. So to mm-hmm. launch today's show, Erica, can you tell off-the-shelf listeners, I know you're in Chattanooga now, but if you could tell us where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up. Um, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, actually. Ah. And um, <laughs> life for me, uh, as a child, my mom used to take us to the library all the time. Um, and she and my sister used to get these big, thick, fat books um, on romance and all of that. And me, you know, I liked Goosebumps and um, all of those little series. And so I used to read those types of books. And But I, I was exposed to the library a lot. And even in school, my favorite teachers were my English teachers. And I had one teacher that was my favorite that was um, my math teacher. But the other ones were always my English teachers because they exposed me to new literature that I had never um, thought of before, that I'd never read and things that I didn't even want to read because I I wasn't a big reader. I was um, uh, I read at a slower pace because I I needed time to process what I was reading. So while everybody you know at those moments where teachers, you guys remember when teachers would um, tell the whole class to read this paragraph quietly, and then afterwards we'll discuss it. Terrified because. I knew that they would give a certain amount of time for everybody to read this. Everybody would be finished before me, and I was afraid to talk about it because I was like, I know I'm not finished, and then they're going to start talking, which means that my brain is going to get um, occupied with trying to listen to them talk so that I don't miss anything and also trying to finish reading my paragraph. So I was terrified because I was not a, a, a quick processor at all, but... Um, my mom always exposed us to books. We were always at the library almost every weekend, and sometimes during the week uh, whenever my mom would get home. And so I just I, I found a love there with um, the books there, just like slightly, just at my own pace, because I knew I could go at my own pace. <laughs> I didn't have to, you know, be so quick and fast to read and, and and um, try to read to anybody. I could just take my time. Um, you but, know, what? yeah, I was. It was a great. It was a great childhood having you know being exposed. And I never realized that until I really looked back on my childhood. And I was like, man, books is always part of my life. Ah, uh, you know, and it's. You, I really commend you, Erica, that you said you know you didn't read super fast, and that you never gave it up. Sometimes when we struggle with things, we're like, no, nah, I'm not good at this, or this is a struggle, and we just we will abandon it. Not only did you not give up reading, you started a bookstore. So I, I really commend you on that. When you were a kid, though, you're going to the library with your mom and your, and your sister, and you're all reading books. What did you dream of being when you were a kid? What did you say, this is what I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> Hilariously enough, um, it kind of got bumped around a little bit. I I wanted to, like, we started off, and I wanted to, all these modeling agencies would come and call us and call me, and we'd go on these casting calls and things like that. And my mom would be like, we don't have any money for this. She'd take me. But then we just <laughs> made, of course, 
always inevitably ask for money. I'm like, well, we don't have any money for this. And so it kind of got bumped because I wanted to be an actress. And oh. in school, I was a part of the drama club. And um, I was the dramatic one in the family. I'm not even going to put, you know, the wild out there. Ugh. I was always <laughs> just the dramatic one. And so I wanted to do that. And then once, you know, it got to the point where it was like, man, this is never going to happen. We don't have any money to pay for me to get classes or do any of that. So I guess I got to, maybe I got to be a doctor. <laughs> so I tried to do the OBGYN and do the doctor thing. And I was like, man, ooh, doctors have to look at cuts and things that we hey! can talk to y'all. I can do this. <laughs> so it, was, it was a process. And then I was like, okay, uh, okay, maybe not a doctor. Maybe not a doctor. Maybe I could be a uh, psychologist or something, a psychiatrist. Mmm, what are you feeling? <laughs> and I'm like, man, I would never be invited to the cookout because so I'd be analyzing everybody. I was like, you know what? Maybe not a psychiatrist. Maybe not a psychologist. <laughs> and, so, and so eventually, like, trickling down throughout the whole little situation, it went on as, for me to be a teacher. And was, I've always loved kids. I've always loved helping um, my teachers do different things. I would even help the substitutes figure out what they were supposed to do in grade school. And um, there was this one day where I was with um, a friend of my sister's, and we were all just, um, it was when I had moved down to Chattanooga finally, and her daughter was learning how to read. And so for a lengthy, long time, now, of course, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm just working with her. Um, and for about two hours, we sat there and we worked on those words. We, I helped her read. I, I, it was just so effortless. And after a while, her mom was like, it's time for dinner. And she was like, is that, how in the world did you just sit there? I was like, what time is it? And she told me, I was like, we've been working on it for about 15 minutes. What do you mean? She's like, no, honey, you guys have been sitting there for two hours, and she's been so into wow. it. You said, I just give up. I just give up and tell her the word. Oh, I'm my like, goodness. Oh, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We just, we just went through it. Wow. And so I was like, oh, a light bulb went off in, and I was like, whoa, okay, okay okay, maybe I can do this teaching thing. So after that, I immediately changed my major, and I started off in the teaching program, and I never looked back. Get out of here. <laughs> now, how did you get to, how old were you when you came to Chattanooga, and what what drew you to Chattanooga? I was, so it was actually just, it was kind of a fluke. <laughs> um, I think I was about 18, 17, 18, because I spent a year in Nashville. Um, I started off um, at Lipscomb University in Nashville. Oh, my gosh, the most expensive decision I've ever made. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> um, and so I started off um, there for one year, um, and it was, a, it was a great school. It was just super expensive. And um, I ended up getting sick. And so my mom, of course, being a mom, she won because I was going to go to Oregon. I thought I was going to Oregon. I was like, Oregon is where I'm going to school. And my mom's like, no, that's too far. You're not going to Oregon. I was like, okay, fine. I'll go to Nashville. Fine. (laughs) And so um, once there, I got sick with, um, I think it was like a touch of vertigo or something like that. And um, I didn't really have family down there to help me or to take care of me. And so my mom was like, okay, you need to go somewhere close where there's family. If you're not going to come back to Memphis, then you got to you need to go somewhere else. Your sister is in Chattanooga. Go to Chattanooga. And so um, I ended up going to Chattanooga with my sister. Um, and I never, I, I never got sick really after that, I don't believe, but – it eventually, once, you know, I trickled down my little major, <laughs> I started um, just going to UTC and hanging out with my sister. And sure enough, I stayed, and she left. She's gone. I was like, wait. <laughs> what? Mom wow. Said, you got to stay here with me. What do you mean? 
<laughs> you know, it's interesting. There's, yeah. You're the second person. You're the second person who I met who moved to a city because their family was there, and some their family encouraged them to come. They got there, and then the family left. I know somebody who felt drawn to Atlanta. She was from New York. Her family was living in New York, Atlanta. Her parents and siblings, you got to get down there, you got to get down there. She came to Atlanta mm-hmm. within a, six months to a year. They were gone. And it's, it's it, maybe that's just the way things are supposed to work. They're there to draw you to where you're supposed to be. Who knows? What subject did you teach uh, in school? And then I want to talk about co- cultural awareness. But what subject did you teach? Did you teach English when you were in school? I taught all of them. I was um, I taught kindergarten, second grade, and third grade, and then I did a little bit of preschool before I started teaching uh, fully. So okay. it was every subject. <laughs> yeah, and and Chattanooga is probably I've never been to Memphis. I'm gonna assume those cities are like night and day. I know Chattanooga is nothing like Nashville. You said you were there for a while. But I want to talk to you. You've lived in different cities. So Memphis, you've seen the different cultures and the, the different vibe in the city itself, from, from Memphis to Nashville to Chattanooga, and there are three different cities. Uh, just from your experience and your working with different students as a teacher and working in the community, why, why Erica, why is cultural awareness important? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so as a, a teacher – Every city I've gone to is, you know, has is a is beautiful. It it, it has its own different way of life, all of that. Um, but as a teacher, that was when I realized that culture was kind of dying in schools. Um, ah. <clears throat> it's um, working inside of the schools. You you more more or less just kind of taught. To the test, and it's it's sad to say, but eventually, like after so long, it, it felt like all the fun was being sucked out of school, and so mm-hmm. it was just like, okay, um, what it, we they would learn. Of course, they you had like the the regular ones, the ones that were just. Uh, concept that everybody celebrates, but nobody really celebrated um, actual culture or of any type. And the only culture kids actually knew about was Atlanta. And we were like, wait, 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 wait. Now that's not a culture, baby. That's that's not really a culture. That's the city. It has its own little thing, but we're just, that's not what it is. <laughs> and so right. they didn't know where they lived. They didn't know um, what city or state it was, but they knew about Atlanta because apparently they had gone to Atlanta or either had heard about it, but there was nothing that was there that actually uh, dove them into um, who they were as children with the color of their skin, where they came from, their background, anything that they were no books that looked like them in classrooms mostly. Like it was just, it was just not there. And I am not the biggest expert on culture at all, but I I at least know, like, little things, at least to, to keep it where it's alive. I know that there are different cultures all around us that we just we see every day but know nothing about. I know, you know, so I wanted to, one, for myself, learn more about the cultures that are around us so that those cultures wouldn't die. And two, I wanted to show kids more of what was around them. It's not just Atlanta. It's not just Chattanooga. It's not just Tennessee. It's not just those, you know, proximity places or the places that you just see, you know, when you get up, your family and all that stuff that you're not being exposed to. It's so much more. There is so much more color. There's so much more culture. There's so much more around you that we don't even know about. From Juneteenth, you know, how long has it been? Like, it, we really kind of just started hearing more about Juneteenth, and it's been around for ages. Yes. So, yes. But how many years have we actually been actually knowing about it or having people wanting to? tell more about it. Um, I know for me, 
probably only been about two to three years of me hearing about people wanting to expose Juneteenth a little bit more. Um, And so in schools, we had, you know, the Black History Month, and then um, they had, what was it? I think in on the, what was it, the standards, they would teach, I think they said something about Davy Crockett, they had Martin Luther King, they had um, a, Ruby Bridges, um, Wilma Rudolph, a few people that, you know, originated in Tennessee of some sort. But it wasn't really culturally diverse at all. And so eventually we teachers started thinking, okay, we need to find books that look like kids in these in here. I know there are a bunch of them. And so my school specifically started looking for books with um, pictures in it and uh, things like that that looked like the kids that we were teaching, that looked yeah. like me. Mm-hmm. And um, that just kind of sparked a lot more because that's not something that happens. And so that for me, that sparked because we were still teaching to the test, even though we were reading books that had kids that looked like we weren't actually teaching the culture or anything like that. We were just still teaching the test, and everything was kind of being still the fun stuff out of school to the point where we weren't even doing, you know, they used to have the pep rallies for the testing so you could motivate all the fourth and fifth graders and, the, like, the people who had to, like, really take the test. They picked that one out. I was like, wait, we're not taking out spirit week, are we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you wonder why kids don't feel like really engaged in school and why school is such a drag. I would tell you when I was a kid, the way I learned about culture was I went to the library and read books on my own. I wouldn't have known in listening to tapes and watching movies and documentaries. I don't think I would have known anywhere near what I, what I do know if I hadn't done that on my own. And fortunately for you, and thank you for what you and the other teachers did, but fortunately for you, you even went a step further. You took it a step further. Were you still a teacher when you started Culture Books? And I wanted to ask you when and why you did you found Culture sure. Books. Yes. Um, I... I was, I think it was like maybe a year or two. I think it was one year of starting culture books before I left the teaching profession. Um, And so I had been there in that particular school for nine years, and um, there had been so much going on, and it just, it felt like it was time. At that point, it felt like it was time. There's so much going on. Things were being sucked out of the kids. It just did not, for me, it didn't feel fun for me anymore. It didn't. When I woke up, I was not excited to go to school um, mm. anymore. And so I was like, I, I don't want to get to a place where I'm, you know, resenting my career or resenting my kids or anything like that. I think it's time for me to go. So um, I left the profession and then officially started um, Culture Books, um, I think the month before. I think it became a 501c3. The month before, I was like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just lay this one down for now and then do teaching in a different way. And it's not, um, and I I wanted to change that. It's not a bookstore itself. It's uh, just a literacy passionate program for kids and I wanted at first I wanted it to be um, a place I wanted to have a brick and mortar to have a place where kids can come and learn more about different cultures about um, and get books that look like them and and taught them about different cultures that are around the world Um, but we weren't able to get a brick and mortar especially because we started like months before COVID just, you know, uh, press us for it. So we weren't even able to get the bookstore or do any of that or get a brick and mortar. So now what we've been doing is um, we've been doing read-alouds, which we paused um, for a moment. But 
we were doing read alouds for the kids to kind of um, read books that look like them and teach them about different cultures and just kind of dive into different things. Um, and there are a lot more things that we actually want to do. We've been giving away books. So the month of February, we gave away um, books by black authors, culture books, um, cultural books, and different things like that to um, kids. Every A book a day, February giveaway is what we did. And we just focused on that. And then um, this past month, we we received a grant, and we were going to give books to kids in hospitals. Because we don't know what their um, literacy um, journey is there, you know, because, you know, I'm pretty sure that when you're in the hospital, we were we're actually teaming up with Ronald McDonald House, and we have to um, go and drop the books off, but we're going to give them some books. We just got that grant, so super excited about that because we actually did get the grant. <laughs> um, awesome. You- you know what, I, Erica, uh, let me know. I would love to get Rosetta. Uh, it's really for kids like 8 to 13. I would love to get that, if I can, into that. I mean, for free uh, to participate as well. You said Rosetta? Rosetta. The, uh, my, my, I have a children's book, Rosetta, the Talent Show Queen. I would love to, if possible, have that book yes, participate as, as well. Yeah. I just think that's a Awesome, uh, Ronald McDonald. I've 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 worked in uh, at companies where they, you know they go prepare meals for the for the families and yes. they just do so much. So I would love to um, just let me know. But I don't want to interject. I can email you about that on the off side. So, but you were telling us so you you that's one thing you're doing. You did the, you do the readathon. You gave away a book in February. Now you got a grant and you're going to uh, give books to the kids in hospitals. What are some other things that that Culture Books does? Um, we want, we're, we've been focusing on just trying to get books in homes lately and just books, just really getting books out there. But one thing we do want to do, we want to do a cultural camp. Um, and so I've been trying to work there and trying to find people who have already created a camp so that they can help me figure this out because we do want to do a cultural camp where kids can come, um, and we're hoping to start that next year. Hopefully, you know, COVID will be um, a little less active. It's still kind of – it's slowing down, but it's not there yet. Um, but we're hoping to kind of um, get something started with a cultural camp where kids can come and learn more about different cultures. Um, we can also um, have a reading program in there for them where we're starting – um, building that foundation right where they are. So you don't have to read fast. You don't have to um, be the best reader. You don't have to even like reading. We just want to give you a foundation so that when you need to read, when you want to read, when you find that book that sparks your reading journey, you will have a foundation so you'll be able to read it yourself. And so um, – that's something that we are looking into doing. I've been trying to run numbers and do all of that. Oh my gosh, the business side of it. It's like it's what it's it is mind boggling and it is exhausting. But we are working really, really hard on trying to get those back and trying to get those events back as well because we were going to have a, a cultural event with I think it was, it was right before COVID hit. Um, we were going to have a cultural event to kind of expose the kids to the Chinese culture. Um, their Chinese New Year was around that time, and COVID hit, and we had to cancel everything. So they would have been exposed to the dragon dancers. They would have had activities to do at the event. They would have um, been able to see the different cultures, eat the food, authentic food, and get take something home um, to that – show that they got a little bit of China, a little bit of the Chinese New Year, even if they haven't been able to go yet, or, you know, that kind of would spark that interest and want to know more about that culture. So those were I love what you're doing. Oh, my goodness, yeah. You've been trying to get done. Yes, ma'am. Wow. You know, and then for Chattanooga, too, I mean, that is, that would be so, 
so good for for the city. I got to keep in touch with you. I just love the work that you're doing. Now, do you? Is it possible for an off the shelf listener, a parent, or or, or even a, 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 a another teacher? Et cetera. Can they go to the Culture Books website and actually purchase books through you that that you ship out to them? Well, we don't um, sell books. I buy them to give them away. I want kids to be able to have access to them freely. We have tons of books here. Like it's literally, we don't have a, a bookstore or anything. So I'm just, you know, I'm I have them at my house and I have a shelf full of book, books. And I read them, um, and we'll probably start back with the the read alouds um, toward May. Um, cause right now, it had been getting crowded. We've been trying to revamp and redo our website and all of that, um, trying to figure out how we can help the most people, even though we can't, you know, go outside and be as close to them as we want to be. Um, so. Uh, but they, if they see a book on our site or on our Instagram or Facebook or something that we've read that we still have, all they have to do is just ask me for it. The before we were trying to, during the read alouds, I would read the book and I would ask the kids a question about the book. It was a comprehension question. And the first kid that answered that question got the book. It was, that was just it. If they oh, need help, I've sure. had teachers kind of ask um about and if you ask me if you send me a message on um, on messenger or whatever i i promise i am still working for you it's just taking me because it's right now it's just me um and so and i'm in school <laughs> i'm doing a lot these days um so and then trying to do more of culture books so i am still working for you don't give up on me um, I've had a teacher ask me if we can get some books for her um, sixth and seventh graders, and we are still working on that to try to get her some books for her sixth and seventh graders. Um, and I've had so you can ask, and we are we are well and open and you know ready to give you free books. You do not have to purchase them. We will get them for you, and we will stock your classroom. <laughs> That is totally fine. Oh wow! Oh my goodness, that is awesome. And then, and then you don't think that need is even out there for schools? But if the if you want to go beyond what the the school will pay for, I guess you would have to go to a a, a resource like Culture Books. Now, I, did, I want to ask you. I know when I was a kid, you said your mom took you to the library, and that's how you really started to develop and acquire that passion for reading and for books. I, as a kid, was a voracious book reader. And I know in my family they encourage all of us to have a library card. Now I'm going the way back decades. That's when you mm-hmm. kids had a library card, and they stamped it, and with a date you had to return it, and and so it's very different now. You can do every so much online, but we went to the library. If you had a school project, you went to the library. <laughs> there oh, there yes. was no internet back then. So, but with my passion for reading, I saw so where. Bad. It helped me to grasp things quicker, faster. I, I felt like I yeah. did better in school because I read so much, and I was able, I could tell you in a book where the teacher, the, where the questions were going to come from, and I, I was I was almost spot on every time. And that came from just reading a lot. And it starts a lot with parents reading to the kids. So I wanted to ask you, as a, as a teacher and working with cultural books, can you share the difference you've seen between like parents who read to their children, what's the what's the cha- what's the difference? A parent who reads to their children very very young ages, even a kid might not really comprehend what they're reading at six months old or whatever, but they start reading to their child very early. Versus a parent who never reads to their child, the parent never reads, they never read to their child. What's the difference you've seen in that child's overall academic success? So uh, a lot of times I use my niece um, as an example, and I I know I probably have like a small bias or whatever, but that girl is a genius. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, okay. But her mom started her early, like I because I'm a teacher. Of course, I gave them I gave them books on books on books, like um, foundational books to read. And even now, if she asks me for books now, I'm like, yeah, girl, we got something here. Come on. Mm-hmm. Let me just go ahead. I'll, I'll put those outside. I sure will. 
Um, and so I started when I started Culture Books. I started actually working with my niece um, on her letters, her numbers, reading books, reading um, the first book when she was three. And so now. With COVID happening, I don't get to see her as much, so her mom works with her on a lot of things. But she started reading with her just from the start, just soon, right in the womb, on out when she was little. Like, as she was growing up, this girl has known education and books consistently and music. And she has – she she never stops. Even As soon as she wakes up, she's on 1,000. She's having – conversations, she understands more, she comprehends more, and she's still a five-year-old. Right now she's five. She's still a five-year-old kid. She still loves doing five-year-old things, but she can have a conversation with you um, and understand what you're saying. If she doesn't, she'll be like, okay, so we, so even with um, COVID happening, her mom having conversations with her and reading books about different things. And so she talks to me. She's like, T.T., um, I, when, when COVID is over, can you come over here so we can play and you can tilt me on the couch? And I was like, I sure can, baby. And she's like, but not right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> she says, but now, not right now, right? I said, no, not right now because um, it's, she's like, because if we see each other, we might get each other sick because of COVID, because people are getting people sick, and that's not good, right? And I was like, that's, you are absolutely right. And she's okay. like, hey, after after it's over, you'll be able to come over here and took me on the couch. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, but we have to wait because <laughs> okay. you might have COVID, and I don't want you to – I don't want to get sick. I was like, but I don't – okay, that's fine. It's – yep, you're right. <laughs> But she, okay. she and, and you know what? And that, I think a lot of it. My nephew is four, and he, he, my sister's a school teacher. But my nephew, when they, when they, when he was going to go to daycare, they said they had to put him in a class with kids two to three years older than him because he was so, so bright. But mm-hmm. they let him play with kids his age. But he's around adults a lot. So it's it when you're around adults and they don't talk like little kid babies to you. You your your language is is flourishes. I see that with him. I, I, he's four. You would think he was eight. He just he talks, and I think that's because the adults around him talk to him. They don't. I mean, very respectful, but not like he's a little baby. And he right. you would not think he was four years old. You would think he was eight if you had a conversation with him. Exactly. So the the biggest thing is have conversations with your kids. My my best friend, she who she has my niece. She bought cards that um, she she would find things online to like engage her daughter in conversation um, to start with questions. So she bought this box of cards, and I can't even remember what it's called now. But I would definitely advocate for it. I'll have to ask her and just put it posted on the website. But these cards um, have daily questions that you can ask your children. And just have them respond to you, just starting up a conversation. So if you don't know what to ask for them, you just pull that card and be like, okay, so if you were um, a dinosaur, what would you do? And there are my, – my my niece is very literal. She's like, but I'm not a dinosaur. She's like, but it pretend if you were – so it's for pretend. So for pretend, right? <laughs> and we're like, yes, just pretend. <laughs> um, but it's not real, right? Not real. It's definitely not real. And so um, – these cards just start with a conversation. They're just there to um, help you have a conversation with that child and just talk because we know that if um, kids who eat dinner with their parents and have conversations with their parents have more of a vocabulary than kids who don't. And kids who are read to um, and are exposed to literature and are exposed to conversation and just um, someone talking to them, have more of a vocabulary, a stronger vocabulary, and a stronger foundation than kids who are ignored and go and watch TV when they eat and are not exposed to that conversation and that social, uh, emotional with their parents at all. So yes. it's very important for for parents to have a conversation. And if you are stumped on what to ask your kids, and it is, 
it can be just kid stuff. It doesn't have to be, you know, the world's problems or anything like that. Or if you are struggling to try to figure out how to explain this, um, just it, the Internet is huge. We will help you. Uh, Culture Books will try to help you as, as best we can. Um, and I can post whatever that um, those cards are called. So right now, it it definitely escapes me. And watch, when we get off this interview, I'm going to be like, ah, ah, there it is. <laughs> it'll, come to, it'll come to you then. You know, you do it'll, so much work. You do so much work, Erica. How do you identify books to include on the culture book shelves? Because fortunately, we are seeing more and more books that deal with different different cultures more children's books, which I think is phenomenal. But what, what's the process? Do you are you a member of a certain type of? Uh, you get newsletters. Uh, I'm thinking Scholastic or what other what other newsletters for children's books that are out there from different organizations, and that's how you decide what to include. Do school teachers come to you and just request a book, and then you include it? Then how do you how do you select books to include at Culture Books? I literally. I research. So on days where I'm off work or on days where I just have a little bit of time, I literally, I get on my computer just like any other person who's just a dork for books. <laughs> and I look up, I look up all types of things. I just type whatever is in the search engine. I'm like, okay, um, what's on? what books do we have on this culture? What books do we have on that culture? I also talk to um what is it called? I also talked to Barnes & Noble. So Barnes & Noble came um, sit with me, um, and they loved what we were doing, and they wanted to be a part of what we were doing and supply books for us. So once I find, once I do all of my research, and it's a book that I think is child-friendly and something that I think the kids would love um, and their families would understand if they were reading, because we don't want to get something that's so scholastic that no one understands it. Now, if you do, I will put that book in your hands. If you want a more scholastic book, then you go ahead then. Um, <laughs> I will give you that book. <laughs> but I want, I want, we want to more build a foundation and expose kids to it rather than just um, starting somewhere that they're not right now. Does that make sense? So yes. we want to yeah. do more of the foundational stuff. Okay. Um, and so I try to find books that are more foundational, that um, kind of expose kids to different cultures, expose kids to books that look like them. And I literally just research. That's all I do. It's nothing. I do nothing super special. Um, I talk to people, uh, owners of bookstores who – may have seen uh, books come across there their where they would want to know about it. I I literally just try to talk. And I, my mom says that I used to get in trouble as a kid because I was talking. And now I don't really, I, I don't know if that's me, Mom. I don't know if she's telling the truth. She probably was because right now I can't stop talking. <laughs> because now you don't talk. <laughs> you're like, okay, why did she say that? Now, I definitely want to ask you this. You see some bookstores and some book publishers, trying to take on Amazon. I remember when Amazon first started, people were like, ah, they never get going. It took them out for get over five years to turn a profit. They had Amazon ads everywhere. And every, similar to when AOL first started, they had, you go into a computer store, you get a free AOL, this. I mean, they just, you just have to keep yourself in front of people, whether you're an author or an entrepreneur, so they'll know about you. But all that said, you know, you you see a lot of independent bookstores. First, they had to take on Borders and Barnes and Noble, and now it's Amazon. In what ways do you find that you're reaching out? You're reaching out to Barnes and Noble. You're reaching out to teachers, and you're you're getting traction. In what ways can brick and mortar bookstores start to really set themselves apart? You have these programs that you run, but how can they set themselves apart from Amazon to reach more book buyers, based on your experience? Um, I feel like I'm just a talker. I think more um, more events about books would be great. There's a lot uh, of bookstores. The reason why we don't know about them is because not a lot of people are 
are you know doing anything on bookstore in bookstores. Um, I know there's a bookstore in Chicago, and they have different events for people to come in and actually um, do things with the book. So even because I, I want to do like a Take It Tuesday where there's a specific area in the store, in the bookstore that I, I want to own for kids to, on Tuesday, you can take you one book and you don't have to bring it back. It's yours. Um, wow. Okay. That's a book you get to experience for yourself. Uh, and so that makes people want to come in more and do more. Like I wanted to do like a storytelling time where, and the library, some of the library, um, they do that now, if I'm not mistaken. I think the public library does some of those events sometimes. I don't know if they're still doing it now. I think they're trying to ease into it since COVID. But mm-hmm. having events and having people, um, word of mouth, friends, posting it, um, Internet is everything. And just coming in there and maybe enjoying a book. Maybe you want to showcase a specific book that month. And you do, like, this storytelling thing. And I know it costs money, but Chattanooga is all about giving away money. I, I And I had to really <laughs> look and learn this. <laughs> but as of recent, like, if I'm looking, because we've been, I've been applying for different grants. And let me tell you, I have gotten both grants that I applied for just recently. Chattanooga want to give some money away. And I was like, okay. man, I just want to give some money. I've just been sitting here not taking this money. Yeah, well, the work you're doing, they they believe in the work you're doing, and they, I mean, reading and literacy is uh, the impact is, uh, I mean, it's just amazing. It, it, you can it could actually you could read a book that could change your life. You could actually read a book, put it down, and and go a whole nother way in your life. It could be a novel, it could be nonfiction. You're in that you're in that good work. So people. I mean, the work you do could affect somebody for decades, the kind of work you're doing. You're getting them off on that good start, and it's just it, – it, it, I, I, so for our authors who are on Off the Shelf, they might be like, ask her this, ask her this. Are you open to authors doing readings on online at yes. Culture Books? And, and if yes, so, yes, what yes, type yes, of yes. books what, – what age group would you be looking for? What type of books, and how could those authors contact you? Um, so another thing that we want to do, um, just literally message me. I message back. If you message me, I promise I'll message back. It might be a day or two because I'm at work, but I will message you. I will. Um, <laughs> but I, I would go, <laughs> I would go and try to find authors, um, around. And we've had a couple of authors read on the platform their book. Um, and it's called Friend Read Friday. So we usually have three days that we read. We have um, Positive Monday, we have um, Wacky Wednesday, and we have Friend Read Friday. And Friend Read Friday is for authors or just people in the community or people in different communities, people who want to do different things, whatever it might be, can come on and read a book that they, uh, a book that inspired them from their childhood, a book they wrote, a book that just means something to them, a book they found. Um, in a bookstore that's kid friendly that they thought that just was so inspired, whatever it may have been that just connected them to that book, they read this book. They'll read it on our platform and share it with the kids. And eventually, um, we can buy that book if it's still on sale or whatever. We would buy it and, and give it to one of the kids, or um, they could choose one of the books we have and give it to a kid they they know in their community that's very deserving. And so. Uh, we are constantly trying to connect, another, and that's just one thing we're trying to do. Another thing we want to do is eventually we want to take scholars to another country and to experience that, that culture firsthand um, and give away scholarships in that way for when they go off um, to college or to school or if maybe if they're just in school and they need some things, we want to be able to give a scholarship away to those kids Um that are deserving, and we want to be able to take those kids um, to a different culture so that they can experience that culture um, firsthand. So I I got to salute you. The- you are, I mean, here you are working, and when you're teaching, and you are still, and you're passionate. 
your passion and your vision has so much clarity. That's probably why you won those grants. Your passion, the work you're doing, and you you have a very clear vision. You can talk to some people and and they don't go into detail about what they they just say. We want to get people kids reading. Reading is important. You are very. Your vision is very clear, and I think other Thank people you. pick up on that. And that's where that support is coming from to coach your books. Now, we're coming down to our last 10 minutes. I definitely wanted to ask you, I know with COVID going on, it's probably impacted it, but can you tell us about the summer reading camp? What happens during that summer camp? So at the summer camp, we, one, want to make sure the kids are reading. So we want to give the kids a foundation. I'm hoping to get some teachers um, in there for a couple of weeks uh, during the summer to get, like, little small groups and start actually building that foundation with those kids while they're there. But not only that, we want them to be exposed to music. I've been speaking with some of my musical friends that I spoke to a while ago um, because having music in kids' lives actually um, opens them up more to um, math and it helps them kind of find that door that needs to be found to open it up to be like, oh, okay, I understand this and I understand that and I comprehend this a little bit more. I mean, uh, music just uh, music is life. It just gives so much more than it. Oh, it's just wonderful. I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, so we, <laughs> I get so excited when I'm talking about it. I can't find the words, but. Um, <laughs> So we want to um, expose the kids to more music, and we also want to expose them to more culture. So they'll get to um, experience authentic food. They'll be able to do different activities with different wow. that come from different cultures. Um, so we're talking to a lot of people. I've actually been trying to get in touch with um, some indigenous people. I've been trying to get in touch with um, people from the Chinese culture, people from um, the African culture, all of these different things, because I have a, I know a friend who teaches African dance. So within that camp, they're going to learn a little African dance. So that camp, they okay. might learn how to dragon dance. So, you know, okay. it's just exposing them. It's all about the exposure. It's exposing them to these different cultures. So when they leave, they're like, oh, my goodness, did you know, Mom? Mom, did you know? Wow. But I know. <laughs> so, there you go. Oh, you know what? When I was a kid in school, they took us on field trips. We went to museums, and, and I don't know if schools still do that uh, anymore, but uh, and then sometimes people go into lawsuits so much that you don't even want to do, do do much. But, yes, that exposure, mm. whether you're – my dad took us. He would tr- take us to different places. We traveled to so many different states. You can tell it in a person when they've had that, or did they just stay in their neighborhood their whole life and maybe the neighborhood is is depressive, and that's all they that's they think the whole world is like that. You got to get out here and travel and read and listen to documentaries, and that kind of segues into my next question as we're we're coming to the end of the show. But there's one question I definitely want to ask you. But before that, how can each of us? We know and thank you for what Culture Books is doing. But how can each of us, parents, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, etc., how can we Build conf- reading confidence in young people because some young people might struggle with reading. How can we help them build that reading confidence so they don't run away from books, but they 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 actually enjoy reading? Read with them. Ah. Like that's like the simplest thing that you can do, even if it's just one book a day, where you share. There have been so many different things. How okay so. One one big thing, when a culture passes down, um, uh, whether it's a recipe or it's a uh, a tradition or anything like that, do they just, you know, just throw the kid on the computer? Are they just hoping the kids find it out themselves? No. Uh. These grandparents, these parents, these um, they come together and they do it together. They, they're like, baby, this is something from my childhood that I wanted to share with you. Come over here and sit with me real quick. And I, it, it'll only take a little time, but just come over here and sit with me. I want to show you this. This is your heritage. This is a book that my teacher read to me that I want to read to you, and it changed my life. I want you to have this. This is something that my mom 
gave to me, and I want to give this to you. This means so much to our family. They sit down and they share these things with these kids. You don't, you, you've you never heard of a culture being like, all right, baby, I need you to look up this right here. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, you, you make a very good point. You make a very good point. On the point. computer yeah. real quick, and yes. it's going to tell you all about your heritage. No. Yes. My grandmother, right. if she had something to tell, like we used to um, have to interview our grandparents to see what, what life was like back then. My grandmother, she had to work in, you know, the house during slavery times, whatever it may have been, all of that stuff. So when I had to interview her, I wasn't looking on a computer. I went to my grandmother's house, and I was like, Grandma, share this with me. Can I interview you? Mm. She's there right now. If you have your grandparents or your mom or your dad or whatever, they have a piece of your culture that you know nothing about. Go talk to them about it. Share yes, it with yes. them. Yes. It starts you know- there. You, and you know what that you I'm sitting here listening to you like oh my gosh, that actually is a is something for the talent show that happens in Rosetta the talent show queen. I was listening to you. I'm like oh my gosh, you're telling part of my story. Uh, I, I and then I, I definitely want to ask you this. We we have like only four minutes left in the show. Have you ever thought about writing a book yourself? And if you did write oh a book, what do you think God. it would be about? Oh my goodness. Um. Yes, I have. It's so funny because you are not the first person that has um, said anything about me writing a book. Like another, a friend of mine last week was like, don't forget, I, I, I didn't forget you supposed to be writing this book, and I'm waiting on this book. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> So, yes, I have. I just I don't know where to start. Start. The first book that I thought about writing was something contradictory to, like, it was something fun. It was something silly. It wasn't even about culture, really. It was just something that I thought was funny. It was called The Noisy Librarian. And um, just because, you know, in libraries, you got to be real quiet. You can't, you're not supposed to talk so loud and this, all this stuff. So I was like, what would it be like if you had a librarian who was super loud? What would it be like if, you know, she came up and she kind of changed the norms. It's going to be just changing the norms. It doesn't have to be about the library. It's just you don't have to stay in the box that people put you in. You can change it up. Like for culture books, switch it up. Like, that's just, and that's just something I've I've been thinking about. I don't know. (laughs) Oh, so you would write a not like almost a nonfiction book, um, and 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 something about with something to do with books. You know, like you said, the 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 library and make it not a place where you you have to go and be quiet, but you can actually talk and socialize at the library and still maybe you have a section where people is quiet, where if they want to go into a quiet space, and then people mm-hmm. are can talk and nobody's coming over to you telling you to shh, shh, be quiet. Very interesting. Exactly. You know, I've never even heard of that. They tell you when it comes to books, if you can come up with something that's new and you know how to push it, and you, you obviously, I can, I can tell from this interview, you know how to get out there and make those connections. I can see where that could be successful for you. Can you tell us, with less than two minutes ago, where off-the-shelf listeners can find you on social media networks? Yes, on Facebook you can find me at Culture Books Chattanooga. Um, we have our own page. You just go there and like our page, and it'll update every so often. That's Culture Books Chattanooga. And Instagram, you can find us at Culture underscore Books underscore Literacy. Um, and then on our website, of course, www.culturebookscha.org. So it's we're around. Message me, <laughs> email me, whatever. Um, our email is culturebookschattanooga at gmail dot com. So you just email us if you have any books that you want to hear read or you want to read. If you're an author, whatever the the case may be, um, find us. We are open. I am looking for new ideas, new people. Come on, I, I like friends. 
Okay, you Please. know what, Erica, I'm, <laughs> I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking that mahogany books just jumped into my head. They're out in the, like the Baltimore, D.C. area, but they've been on the Today Show. But they, they, they probably started, I'm assuming, similar to you, and I think they just opened mm-hmm. a new brick-and-mortar store. Your passion, your vision, your clarity, I can see you being a mahogany. In in a in a place doing what you're doing, similar to them, in another few few years, the way you keep going and you know how to reach out, and make those contacts. I am so 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 glad we had you on Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio. Again, I want to give out your website, Culture Books Cha, C U L T U R E B O O K S C H A dot org. Culture Books, C-H-A dot org. Oh, Erica, Erica, the the, the, the Wacky Wednesdays, the Friendly Friday, the, 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 the scholarship and the travel and the different things, introducing kids to the books and the music and working with the, now with the Ronald McDonald House and the grants to get the books into the, the, not only the schools but into the hospitals. This is so, so much that Erica Denise here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Memphis, born and raised, is doing right now. Thank you so much, Erica, and thank you. I mean, I cannot thank you enough for all that you are doing. The, the young children's thank lives you. are packed. I mean, you could be changing families and I not even know it. So so thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to all of our off-the-shelf listeners. Please come back next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will have another phenomenal guest for you. For those who might have come into the show midstream, no worries. When the show finishes streaming, you can go back and listen to it as many times as you like in its entirety. And please share it with parents and school teachers and those who who in the community who care about literacy, especially as it impacts children. Erica, I'll shoot you an email with a link when the show finishes streaming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Bye.